Yes, hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. It is of course the international break this week, which means there will be no pre-game show, no full-time show, no fan reactions, but of course the show must go on. So I am going to do, obviously as you can tell, uh, another episode of Journal Talk. Obviously we've had Andy on the channel quite a few times, but we've kind of like rebranded getting Andy on and, and stuff and, and got other journals on as well. Obviously you'll remember we had Andy and Matt on not long after VK was, uh, I nearly said sacked then, but not long after he left. Um, and we're going to do it like this again. We're going to get Andy on. We're going to have a chat to him about the transfer window and stuff like that. And then hopefully we'll see him uh, and other journals somewhere down the line as the season goes on. But Andy, how are you doing, mate? You all right? Good, mate. Yeah, yeah. Glad the uh, the window's shut and everything's calm for once. <laughs> I don't know how you do it because uh, obviously I now have the podcast page. And I all I do is get news off people like yourself and Matt and other journals, and then just regurgitate that. And even I was getting stressed. I'm like, Jesus Christ, Like it's just nonstop. It must have been the busiest or one of the busiest windows you've covered because the, the last three summers, to be fair, have been all quite hectic, haven't they? But this one felt a little bit extra. Like, How did you feel on this one? Was it a little bit more busy than usual, do you think? Certainly the last month, last three weeks. I mean, when you look at Bernie's business, pretty much all of it was done in August. Um, you know, there was... I think that's what made it feel as chaotic and, and whirlwind. And, and it was the point where it was a you know a different player being linked away every single day. And and you knew that Bernie were gonna to have to bring players in. So then suddenly, you know, that side of things starts ramping up a little bit more as well. So it was just it was non-stop. It was it was difficult to cover for a number of different reasons and 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 things going on. But um yeah, no, probably the most stressful, maybe the word, especially those last three weeks, um, because it was just like something happened every hour never mind every day at <laughs> times so it was just one of them whereas as you say the other ones have been busy um yeah. you know you think companies fair summer but there wasn't that many outgoings because there wasn't many players to get rid of um obviously there was there was a few main ones but they were also done quite early um so then it was more just a, a, a nice constant stream of incomings and, and last summer again there was there wasn't many the many exits it was more incomings so this year with it being both sides it was a little bit more um, stressful in that sense, but also it was expected because of the the size of the squad going into the summer. Yeah. So you knew things were going to happen. Yeah, you've you've described it perfectly there when you said chaotic and whirlwind. Obviously, you do the big transfer analysis pretty much every summer, and, and in January, I think you do. Always enjoy reading that one. Um, I, I probably speak on behalf of the majority of Burnley fans here. I would hope all Burnley fans when I say we do appreciate your work, mate, in the transfer window. It's always a pleasure to. To get an Andy Jones, especially when when you get one of the um, the agent led journalists, shall we say, who say, "Oh, this player wants away," and then like fifteen minutes later, we get a tweet off Andy saying, "No, this, this, as far <laughs> as I'm aware, everything's fine." I was like, "Oh, thank God for that." So we do appreciate your hard work, but you've described it perfectly there, where you say chaotic and whirlwind. Why do you think it was so chaotic? I know you've referenced the size of the squad there already. But did we really need to lose all these main players as well? I mean, we'll get into why in a bit, but like it was yeah. just so whirlwind, as you said, wasn't it? The transfer window. So I was told sort of earlier in the summer, and, and this was, I think, this was before. I think, but thinking back, I think it was before Parker was appointed at this point, where the expectation was mainly we're going to lose a few players. And I think I wrote this. I think it was a, a piece that I did after company gone, and sort of what was next for Burnley and. Um, I think within it, it was it, the sort of sense that you were getting was it was going to be a fairly busy window of outgoings because there was, you know, a squad that needed trimming, but also an acceptance from Burnley's point of view that, as they did two seasons ago, that there were certain players in the squad who either deserve, almost deserved to play in the Premier League or they were accepting that, you know, these players were going to move on and, and move up. Because one of the things Burnley want to, they don't want to be seen as, just a complete stepping stone. But I think what they want also want to convey to players is that they're not going to handcuff them and say, you can never leave, um, which is, I think yeah. was the impression of the previous, like the, the club that people were trying to get. You look at the James Tarkovsky situation where, you know, for a number of summers, there was offers and, and sort of the, the sense that he was going to be allowed to go and then never left and then had to end up basically running his contract down to leave. So I think they've tried to change that perception a little bit and I think the type, the type of players you're trying to attract is you have to sort of do that. You have to say to another bear, listen, you know, you come here, you develop, ideally stay longer than a year, for example, but, and then, you know, we will allow you to move on to, and, and get that big move, if you like. Um, so there was an acceptance at sort of three, four, maybe five of the, the first team 
players who were playing regularly. Um, because I think some people got a little bit confused. I think when I wrote that piece of oh, just three to five first team players as in the squad in general, but it was more the people like the Sanderbergs, the other bears. Um, and then and and there wasn't going to be well, there wasn't the expectation was it wasn't going to be a massive incoming summer of incomings, largely because of the squad, because you've got to chop it down. And you only you can only have twenty five. Yeah, you can have the the under twenty ones, but you can only have mm. twenty five people in your squad. Um, so there was that element to it as well, as that it it kind of was dependent on how many they got out as to how many they were able to bring in. Um, but then that obviously changed. Um, the the transfer market was weird this year. Um, in the sense that due, there were very little happen, very little seemed to happen in June, with the exception of the PSR. You know. <laughs> interesting deals that were done at the end of that month. Um, and then obviously July was largely taken up by the European Championships, Copa America. So in terms of the, you're looking at the bigger clubs and that's usually the first domino to fall of who are they going to get? And then, you know, the money trickles down and everything gets you know, spread and people are assessing squads and, you know, injuries and all that type of stuff that can come from those tournaments. So it was pretty slow and then that brings you to August. Um, and then I think, you know, they, they do the sales of Adebayer and Berg. And from what I was told, Bernie, that was kind of what they felt they needed to do. There was obviously mm. other players who might have moved on. You know, Trafford was linked away all summer and the the, side, the sense was that he was going to move. And obviously that didn't happen. Um, and there was, you know, there was obviously in the interest in O'Shea and stuff like that. But it was felt like they were pretty comfortable. And then it was going to be letting the fringe players go, like the, the Twines, the McNallys, who've, who've been out on loan. You know, is there a future? Is Is it better for them to move on? Um, but then I think that's when you began to sort of get the sense that a lot, you know, there were, were unhappy players and players wanted to move away. And and I think Park has alluded to it himself in terms of yeah. sometimes the idea, you know, people around them, you know, agents and things like that about, oh, we can get you this move, we can get you that move. Um, you know, they can they can sort of convince players that that elsewhere that you know, the grass might be greener. Um, and I think that's sort of what happened. And then there was there was a lot of interest in players. And I think it's one of them barely have a price for every player. There is no player that's unsellable. Um, it's where you set that price. And I think I, I mentioned in the piece that I wrote that if you take all of the emotion out of it, the business that Burnley have done in this window is unbelievably good in terms of the the model that they're trying to adhere to, um, in terms of the, the buy young and relatively cheap and then sell high you know, after they've developed them. Um, obviously, yeah. it's not quite the plan because you'd want to be still in the Premier League, develop them, maybe develop them another year and and maximise that value even more. Um, but yeah, that, that was a sense that I got that it was suddenly, a, a, you know, a number of players sort of indicated that they wanted to leave and and then there were opportunities that the players also felt that they wanted to take as well. Um, and the problem was that it wasn't, you know, something that, you know, was constant throughout the summer it all just sort of felt suddenly this happened and then it was like how yeah. do we deal with it and it was all at once and that's why it felt as crazy as it did yeah you've uh, sort of like referenced a few things i do want to talk about there but um you do reference in the article which is obviously on the athletic website now uh, that nine players left in 13 days obviously you've said there that a lot of players suddenly then felt they were unhappy or or, or let the club know they were unhappy what changed? Because at Luton, nobody looked unhappy. Now I know, pe I know people can play football and look happy and, and be unhappy. I get that. But at Luton, we were fantastic. We looked together. There was a connection. You again, you referenced that in your article. There was a connection again between the fans and the players. We then played Cardiff at home after selling Order Bear. I think we sold Order Bear like a couple of days before that, if memory serves. Apologies if that's a little bit off. But then we still won convincingly. That well, the performance might not have been very convincing, but the scoreline was. So what changed? I know there's now this hasn't been referenced in your article, but there is the the rumors and and stuff of the WhatsApp message from the under twenty one guy. Is that an issue that's that's made a lot of players unhappy, or was something already brewing, or is it just a case of players just decided that the championship wasn't for them? It's a good question. I don't I don't think there's a definitive answer that I can that I can sort of give you. Um, it's it, there's a load of different different things I think that play into it. I think there is the element of the, the the domino effect that suddenly players see others leaving and um you know is that is, is it an opportunity they want to take. I think there is an element of also while it was 
a lot of players leaving. I think when you when you when you go through the list and you look at who actually left, I think you look at a, a number like you know, there's a few players in there that you would have expected to leave. Like even though Vegas plays in the first two games, it, there was never a sense that he was going to stay. It was always yeah. that he was going to move, and it was more of the surprise that he was involved. You know, you had McNally, for example. <sighs> you know, you had a couple of players who who maybe maybe didn't think, maybe thought they were going to be featured more than they were. So, you know, Anna Sorori, for example, probably, you know, would have hoped to have been, you know, in the team, um, you know, from the start of the season. That wasn't the case. Um, you know, so that, that you know, that, that, can, that can play into it. I think there's interest from, you know, prem, when you've got someone, you know, Premier League clubs coming in for someone like Dara O'Shea, you know, that it's, it's obviously going to, you know, interest them. Um, to go back to the, so I think there's loads of different things that, from from what from what I understand, I think there's, I don't know exactly if that you know the the WhatsApp stuff is exactly true, but I know there's there's certainly elements of it that are, are definitely true. It would have had some impact around the training ground, no doubt, because it's just yeah, I imagine. Um, you know, it's it's not the type of thing that that you want to sort of see, um, or or sort of you know, it's 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 not exactly it's going to unsettle people, I imagine. Um, and then I think, yeah, the timing just seemed a little bit, you know, it's just as I sort of explained in the last in the last answer, really, the timing of it all just all just came together at one time, and 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 a lot of players, I think, you know, suddenly the market sort of kicked into life a little bit more, and and that's when you get more interest, and and I think there was probably certain moves that the players, you know, fancied or or were open to, and and I think if you know if Bernie were wanted to, you know, were you know, a price was hit, then, you know, that, you know, they're, they're going to look at it and, and it, if it suits all parties, because I think even, even the likes of Azorori and Alder Keel, you know, Alder Keel is, you know, a centre-back who, you know, wasn't necessarily first choice, you know, was was a little bit down the pecking order. You know, it's yeah. probably one of Burnley's stronger positions in terms of depth and they were able to add, you know, two players in. So, you know, you've, you've essentially replaced Alder Keel with, you know, Bashir Humphreys, who's, you know, a young you know, a young centre back with with loads of potential, which is probably what you would describe Alda Keel as. Um, obviously, yeah. last season didn't go too well, and there was injuries and stuff as well that, that sort of affected things later on. But you know, it's I think I think it's at the time it felt oh what you know the club are selling everyone here, and and I can understand why that there was that sense. Um, but I think it was it was a little bit of a you know, take the step back and, and make you know the club need knew they needed to do business suddenly to get to get people in and and it was a little bit of a not a panic but a bit more of a scramble of, of probably not expecting to need to do the business that they needed to do. Um but yeah I think it was a, it, essentially it was you know there, there was the, the financial side of it of course um uh, that plays into it but I think also that that they inherited us you know a, a number of players who were generally just unhappy at the club and and you know that they, they it's difficult to know exactly when they would have made that that known but I think what yours you know but you can't sell a player if there's no bids <laughs> at the end of the day so yeah. there could have been a player who who said you know at the start of July mm, I'm not really happy here but if there's no bids for them then you can't really what what are you supposed to do with them I'm not saying that was that's a specific example about a, a player but just a, a just a bit of a hypothetical example um, that you have to you have to play the market in a, in a sense. So Billy were generally quite relaxed about they were you know they were happy to wait to an extent. Obviously, I don't think they quite expect, expected the onslaught for the number of players leaving, um, yeah. but they were happy to wait into August because they felt they were going to get the fees that they thought you know for another bit of the Sanderberg. They may not have got that fee you know in June, July, for example. So they were happy to wait on that to to get the best value, which which I think in those two deals they definitely did. Yeah, I think um, when you look at them two deals specifically, um, I, I, I do agree we've got quite a good amount for them. Um, there was quite a bit of talk on Twitter about um, agents and stuff like that, like agents sort of like, I mean, it's, I think it's fair to say that agents pretty much run the transfer market at the minute. It's it, if, if an agent wants a player to move, the player ends up moving, the agent fills the player with um, a lot of rubbish in the head and things like that. Do you think agents played a part in this as well, I, I, just going back to Mission to Burnley as well, there's um, a bit where they're talking um, about agents and stuff like that with the fan advisory board. It feels like the club's relationship with agents is a little bit 
not broken, but a little bit sort of like tender or something like that, what I'm trying to explain, and, and they don't really have a great relationship with him. Do you think the agents maybe uh, had a big part to play in this as well? I think they definitely did. I think, as, as I said earlier, Parker, you know, referenced it basically in a couple of his answers about, you know, players being sort of, you know, instructed or guided in, in a way that, you know, maybe from Burnley's perspective, they, they thought, you know, it wasn't the right way to guide the players or they were maybe trying to sell them a, a bit of a dream um, that that maybe didn't happen or, 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 or you know, they were able to, to get them out of there and, and stuff like that. I think... You know, Pace, um, I remember one of the first interviews that Pace gave uh, when he arrived, I think just after the, f- the first January, and he talked about agents and he <laughs> he wasn't the most complimentary of them, I think it's fair to say. And, I th- you know, the agents are there to do to, to you, what they're supposed to do is get the best for the client, but not all yeah. agents do that. You know, some are. And, uh, you know, there's there's elements of, of money that, that are, you know, you know they want certain fees from certain deals, and and that that can ultimately sometimes be why why things break down um, and why deals don't happen. But also they, you know, they are out there speaking to clubs and speaking to, and seeing who's interested and who what you know where they might be able to to take the player next. Um, so yeah, you know, there's there's no doubt that they, they definitely played a part in in this, and and, and Parker basically you know said that um, in in itself, and and it's. You know, sometimes it is that that team going down from the the Premier League and and players, you know, agents thinking they can, you know, they want to move the players on um, to another club or a better situation, maybe, and you know, in a top division somewhere. And um, I think that you know that all plays into it. Um, so yeah, yeah, agents definitely play the part. How how big each, you know, in in terms of each transfer, for example, is 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 difficult to know. Um, but you know, they, they, there was definitely an influence there on on certainly some of the players who who left or or you know were looking to leave. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like this summer has been worse for it. Like, there's it just seems to be everywhere. There's always like, oh, this player's unhappy. Like certain journalists and stuff on Twitter, this player's unhappy. He wants to leave. Like you could just tell that an agent has told him to say that, and it just it just infuriates me. I just feel like it, it were a lot worse this summer than it usually is. Um, in terms of the transfer window, though, a couple of interesting subplots, obviously. <laughs> Uh, JBG came back and then left again. What 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 happened there? Was it just a case of he didn't have any offers on the table? And we were like, I think Alan Pace referenced he saw him on a flight back from Amsterdam, um, and he referenced uh, and they met each other. They had a chat, uh, and then he came back. And then do you think it's a case of not long after that, Saudi Arabia got in touch and just said, "Hey, oh, mate, you're on. Just putting a figure out there, twenty grand a week. We can give you sixty grand. Is that kind of what happened with that one?" I think so, yeah. I think it was just an opportunity that that was quite unexpected. Um, obviously, that wouldn't have been on the table, you know, when he when he resigned for Burnley because you know he just would have taken that straight away. Um, mm. You know, I don't I don't know the you know all the ins and outs of of what he was being offered and and what and what might have been on the table for him when he resigned for Burnley, but I think you can imagine that you know he would have you know basically be coming back to. You know, back home, if you like, because he, he spent so long at the club, and you know he was there, wasn't he? For the, uh, you know, there was a picture on Instagram of him there for the, yeah. the derby the other day as well. So evidently, Burnley's, you know, very, still very much in his heart. Um, but I think yeah, it was just an opportunity that that sort of came out out of nowhere, really, and, and Burnley were able to in a, in a, in the end profit a little bit on it because, you know, they were able to sort of, you know, that was one that. That, you know, that did come out the blue, but um, you know they, they were able to get a little bit. I don't know exactly what the, the fee they would have received was, but I think they, they certainly you know got a bit of, of money out of the deal, um, and then were able to sort of look for a replacement for him um, because I think it, you know it made loads of sense to bring him back because I thought he was excellent in the in the championship season with company under company yeah. a couple of years ago. Um, I thought he, re- he played really really well, um, you know sort of the, mainly in that midfield role, you know second half of the season especially. Um, so I think it made loads of sense, and it there wasn't really a. It didn't look like last season was you know where he was he was winding down that much. Yeah, the Premier League to step up, and I think it showed that he's maybe, you know, he was he's becoming more in in between that Premier League Championship level. But I still think he would have been a massive asset in in the Championship. Um, but yeah, I think it was one of those one of those situations that just that you know that added to the the drama of it all. That you uh, you let a player go, resign them, and then sell them in <laughs> in the. Uh, in two months, it's uh, it's a bit, bit, bit crazy, but um, yeah, yeah, I think that was that by the signs of it was just an opportunity that that he 
felt was was best for his family and and um, you know the, then the move was made. Yeah, I think you sum it up perfectly there. It does personify the chaotic side of our transfer window. But again, I don't think any Burnley fan really begrudges uh, something like that. Uh, I do want to quickly circle back a little bit because you did reference earlier when we were talking about the clear out that there was the financial side of it. Obviously, there was a lot of people worrying on Twitter that maybe we had money issues. Uh, some people calling it a fire sale. Some people being a little bit more dramatic and calling it asset stripping. You mentioned there the financial side of it. Is there any worry that the club were in any money issues or have any issues towards sort of like profit and sustainability rules or points deductions or anything like that? Um, for the people I spoke to, I think PSR is fine. Um, I think helped by the number of sales that they did make in the end. Now, whether it might have been a bit of a more of an issue if you know, they, they hadn't sold who they sell. And, um, but I think when you, when you look at the money that they brought in, it's, you know, it's over a hundred million plus, plus the company money that they get, you know, yeah. it was an extra 10 million effectively and that the player sold. Um, you know, they, were, they, they hired a manager who, um, you know, didn't have to pay compensation for it as well. So, so in that is, you know, it's a pretty big profit you're making there. Um, yeah, I think there was obviously financial reasons, um, as there is for any club going down from the, from the, from the Premier League, um, because of, you know your television money harsh, and I know that the new deal is is coming. I don't, I don't quite know how much that moves the needle on, on how much clubs will, will earn from from TV money this year. But I can't imagine it's you know significantly affect or changing things. Um, so there was that element. Um, obviously the wage bill would have reduced, but um, you know as 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 he did you know in the previous. You know, time they came down, he, he sold seventy million pounds worth of players, really. And you know, it's they were you know fifty million for for Bergen or the Bear was a really good start. You'd add in the the money from Murich, which I think, you know, all in all, I think was a really good deal for Burnley. I think you know, I, I you know, would you have valued them at that? Possibly because of the way he ended the season, uncertain things. But then he's shown at Ipswich that he's still got the the big mistake in him. Yeah. <laughs> So there's, there's that element, and then and then you factor in the company. So you're talking about seventy ish million bring, being brought in from from those four things. So and you knew they, they were gonna they were gonna move on a couple of the other you know the, the twines the McNallys. You were gonna sort of top that up, and and anyone you know the, the likes of Chael and of and, and of a family they couldn't move on for permanent because it was you know there wasn't really the interest there. Then you know they were gonna loan those those types of players out. Um, so there was the elements of money, and and you look at the spend in, in the Premier League. It was a huge spend, and he barely got any money back in. Uh, you know, he didn't really sell anyone. It was, it was just Bobby Thomas for a couple of million. Um, yeah. So you know that. So that was a big outlay. So the, the, there was there was financial elements, but it certainly wasn't expected to this scale. Um, you know, this is you know this wasn't the plan when Parker walks in the door, for example. Um, he he accepted the the vision, the, you know, and was aligned with the you know the board that there were going to be sales and, and he's he admitted that in interviews you know he said that you know we know not, not everyone's going to be with us by the by the end of the deadline and, and you know that was obviously before other bear and berg were were gone um uh so yeah there was there was obviously circumstances which then probably enhanced Burnley's financial situation but I think there also is the element of you know Burnley had two big obligation to buy or you know option obligation to buy deals um in S7 and Trezor that the were, were executed. Um so you know you you already start, I mean you spend probably roughly around 26, 27 million uh in the in the season under comp you know season under company when they were you know creating his first squad. You know, S7 Trezor probably equated to around 25 million themselves. Yeah. So you've already got a big outlay, which I think you can you can forget because you're almost you know there are players already. Um, so there's that factor in, and then there was little bits of business there, and um, but there wasn't loads of money, at, you know, at the end of there wasn't much money at all to sort of go out and uh, and go out and spend at the end of the window, even with the, the you know the, the money that was coming in, and there's all all different things, the way deals are structured and all that type of thing about, you know, even when you sell someone for fifteen million. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean you're getting. You know, it can be paid in installments. But they've done it themselves in the way they've structured deals, and and even in the sales, I think you can go through the accounts and the Dwight McNeil deal, for example. At Everton, we're pay, sort of paying five, six million over a, a number of years each to sort of get up to that twenty million. So there's all those factors that come into play, and, and that there was an element of why that's why Bernie were looking more at loans than than yeah. sort of permanent deals. Obviously, they do Hannibal for a permanent, um, and you know. The, 
potentially, you know, put a lot of money down already for next summer in terms of some of the players who could become, you know, either options or obligations to buy. Um, so, yeah, I think obviously there's not loads of money there. Um, but I think that's that, that's what happens when it is a consequence of, of going down. I don't think I don't think it was a fire sale, and that it was more. I think it was more players wanting to leave related than you know a money related thing. But there was that. There was definitely an element of that, and and it's why they couldn't then go and spend twenty million in the last couple of weeks because you know it was that 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 fine balancing act and. And you know they've in the, in a way because the way the way Bailey looked at sort of the because I, I saw sort of the frustrations I guess at the at the structure of some of the deals like you know when I sort of reported the the Morgan Whitaker you know offer yeah. first offer and yeah. there was a lot of sort of anger and frustration I I understood it to an extent but sort of the way it's been put to me is that loan with options and obligations do give you that little bit of leeway. Um, to sort of see if it's going to work because if Burnley had put down, you know, for, for example, you, you take the Zion Fleming deal and, and what it seems to be the, the option obligation, bit of a dispute on what exactly it is, but um, it's around 8 million quid. If Burnley spend 8 million quid this summer and then it doesn't work out and he has a bit of a, a bad season, then suddenly they're, they're stuck with that player. Whereas if they get a loan and there's the option in there, if it doesn't work out, they can all, you know, you know, shake hands and go, I didn't wear. Um, so there's an element of, of trying to be smart in that in that sense. But obviously I understand why clubs might also not be particularly entertaining of um all those offers. But by the by the sounds of it, even the Whitaker deal seemed to be more based on a replacement not being found before Plymouth were going to engage in negotiations rather than the, the first offer was was nowhere near what they wanted. But I think the second yeah. offer that Bernie made was a little bit more on the right lines, and that was again alone with an, an option obligation. Um, so I think, yeah, it's 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 that fine balance. But yeah, there, there was there was financial things. But I think, given the amount Bailey of, of sort of, you know, if 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 they stay in the championship and they don't get promoted in the next couple of years, then I think that's when it becomes a bit more of a concern. But at the moment, it seems to be from what I've been told, PSR wise, they are they should be and and, and feel like they're fine. Well, fingers crossed we'll get promoted then. Um, else we could see an actual physical fire sale, but I guess we'll cross that bridge if we have to uh, in a couple of years. Obviously, on the, on the other side of it, there was a few players that stayed. Lyle Foster, Luca Colliorsho, uh, James Trafford. Um, these three were all players that was reported, not by yourself, but by other um, so like agent-led journalists uh, that they wanted to leave, especially Luca. And even, even Lyle as well, to be fair. I think... I think Trafford, I never saw anything reporting saying he wanted to leave, more stuff that people were coming to that conclusion because of stuff that he was putting on Twitter and Instagram himself. Um, but with Foster and Luca, there was quite strong reports that they wanted to leave. What was the situation surrounding them? Is any of that sort of like legit or were they always happy to sort of like knuckle down and, and stay at the club? It's it's difficult to know, isn't it, without without fully asking them and, and you can hear different, different sides of things. And, and I certainly heard elements of, you know, want now or want to go um but it's you know it is it's difficult to definitively say um I, but i think for for someone like Colliasho, for example when you've got wolves a premier league club you know been a pretty stable premier league club you know yeah. interested that you know, you can see why he'd be interested in it um you know it's it's it, it's difficult to know you know if he was you know demanding to leave or anything like that it's, you know it's but you can see why it would have turned his head. I think Foster, you know, I think by the, from my understanding, there was there was intermediate, you know, intermediaries offering him to Ipswich, and and Ipswich weren't particularly interested. And I'm not surprised by that because they'd already bought the lap and uh, yeah. Schmodix in, and and were trying to bring Broward in at that point as well. Um, so so there's that there's that element of and, and there's, there's, they bring sort of back to the agent sort of side of things and, and, and their influence in, in proceedings. Um and Trafford <laughs> Trafford the expectation was he was gonna leave this summer. Yeah. There was there was just that expectation, which I think was why there wasn't necessarily that are oh, you know Trafford's you know doing this, doing that, or trying to, you know, force an exit. There was just an expectation and just the way that I think you know Newcastle seemed to be the destination and, and he obviously had that early bid in the summer rejected 
Um, Burnley obviously wanted more, understandable. I think they were, they were able to stand the ground on, and they were able to stand the ground on a number of, you know, those three players, for example, and um, in terms of deals. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, and in the end, Newcastle, with their situation, you know, it was a bit of a messy end to the window for them, wasn't it, in terms of not getting gay, um, you know, for all that money, but also the PSR situation at the end of June where they brought in the, the Forest goalkeeper, um, I'm not going to try and pronounce his name, but you know that added to the goalkeeper ranks, and then they didn't, you know, Dubravka didn't leave, you know, so they, they had a lot of goalkeepers. So if it felt like it needed a domino to fall for the Trafford move to finally happen, and in the end it didn't. Um, mm. So he, you know, he stays at Burnley, and um, you know Burnley had covered themselves well, I think, in if his exit had been confirmed, and in Green and. Uh, Haladki coming in, um, you know, the two really good keepers, and you know, it's a really strong goalkeeping unit now that they've got. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that, yeah, so it's it's difficult to know exactly what to the extent these players were, if they were, you know, or were trying to force their way out. Um, but I think Burnley were able to stand firm on certain on certain players, and you know, if, if deals weren't there, you know, like Benson's another one who, who was linked away, um, but I just don't think there was any particular interest in there. You know, substantial interest. So, you know, you you know, sort of just move on, and you know, and there might be a few apologies that need to be made from from certain people. Um, there might not be. You know, it might just be <laughs> right. You know, crack on. Um, yeah. so it's it's difficult to know exactly. You know, and you know, if they do an, another mission to Burnley season, I'd say uh, this might be the the pinnacle of of uh, the, you know the, the these last couple of weeks will probably be the pinnacle of the the the, the series. If you like, that's probably going to be yeah. the best watch bit. Um, so we might be getting a little bit more insights in, into that um, that side of things, but yeah, you know, it was it was just a very very difficult difficult last couple of weeks to, to navigate, and you know, the rumours and the speculation it certainly didn't help things. Um, but you know, there was there was into you know Wolves you know put down a twenty million pound package, and you know Burnley could easily have accepted that. You know, they would have made a, an extremely handsome profit on the two and a half million he spent on Corriasho, but. They stuck to the guns on that one and, and they were in a position to be able to do that as well. Um, you know, if, if there's an element of if if you were seriously fire sale, you know, in that in that mode, that that's something that you just would have taken straight away. Um yeah. if you need if you needed the money. So there was there was elements of that at play as well. So yeah, it's as I say, it's, it's difficult to know exactly what you know the, the full ins and outs of the situation, but um, you know, the weird elements ongoing behind the scenes about those different different deals. Yeah, I'm glad you referenced uh, Mission to Burnley. Uh, we did have Matt, who owns or well, co-owns Ad Hoc Films, obviously the production company behind Mission to Burnley, on the channel around three weeks ago when it all started dropping on Sky Sports Football. For those of you that don't have Sky Sports Football, like myself, because uh, I refuse to pay those prices, well, I might have it on a perfectly legal streaming device. Um, then it has recently dropped on Sky Documentary. So if you have recently just watched Mission to Burnley 2 and you want to see an interview with Matt, you can do so on the channel now. But he did reference in that interview that they may not be a mission to Burnley 3, but they also may. They haven't had the conversations yet, but they were at Luton filming it. And they're back to the transfer market. Some more positive things to talk about this time. We're going to talk about the incomings. Obviously, I'm not. I'm going to skirt over Trezor and Esteve because obviously you've already referenced them and they all came in last year or in January and then were just the obligations were triggered this year. So we knew they were all already Burnley players. I do want to talk to you about Mike Trezor though um, in a little bit as well. Um, but bringing in the likes of Hannibal, Warrell, Hontondre, who I'm still certain I'm butchering that, uh, Perez, um, Shirandi Sambo, Etienne Green, Haladke, Sarmiento, these sort of like ones as well, sort of like later in the window, your Sarmiento, your Anthony, your Humphreys, uh, your Fleming and your Laurent. How do you feel about those incomings? I mean, I, I, I understand it would have been hectic for Burnley and we've discussed all that, but in terms of quality and the sort of like players that we are bringing in, how do you feel Burnley have, have done on that sense? I think I think they've recovered the situation well um, in terms of reaccumulating that depth um, because I think when when you look at it there's and you know when when you bring everyone back in because um, it was referenced to me that the Sunderland game um, there was only four there was I think it was only four changes to the starting eleven and two of them were Cullen and Colliasso who were injuries um, so when you when you look at that, it wasn't necessarily the start and eleven that was being changed. It was more the bench that I think yeah, everyone. The depth, yeah, yeah. So it was the depth, and 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 I think Andoni was on the bench for Sunderland as well, and there was an expectation that you know he was someone who was also going to leave. Um, 
it, you know, and, and the, the rumors and the speculation that started about about that, I think at that point already. Um, so yeah, I, th I think I think they've had a, in terms of incomings, if you just take the incomings, I think they've had a good window. Um, I think they've they've put themselves back into a position where after you know when you saw the the number of outgoings and you know it was suddenly and and the squad at Sunderland and it was if you if they don't make serious inroads into the window in the last couple of weeks, you know you you you're starting to doubt whether they're fully a playoff team. I think when you look at that Sunderland team, you know, with and even even with you know a couple of players I was injured, it wasn't it didn't scream. You know, this is a this is a team that are going to finish in the top six to me anyway. Yeah. And and okay, that's one game. And you know, the comments afterwards from a staff Parker and Brian Hill all pretty much summed up the the sort of state of shock and and you know uncertainty that was hanging around the club. So that that wouldn't have helped um, either. But I think what they've done is definitely cemented themselves back as one of the better squads in the league. Um, I think with what they've brought in. Um, it's going to be interesting. I think it's a, you know you know an interesting test for Parker now that this this two week break is effectively a, a mini pre season for him. Um, yeah. And that he's, he's suddenly got five, six, seven players that he's got to gel in, and not that the <laughs> not that the pre season will feel like a waste completely, but suddenly a lot of the players he was working with and and you know drilling into his tactics and, and the game plans and and all the principles that you know a lot of them have now gone. So we'll be relying on those who are still around. You know, to 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 pass that on and, and be and be important players for them. You know, the likes of a Brownell and Cullen and and those types of players um, who who would have been you know doing that anyway. So I think I yeah. think in isolation of the, of the the incumbents, I think I think they've had a good good window. I don't think you know there's still holes in the squad. I think there's still you know you know with Vitinho's sort of surprise exit. I think that you know probably the most surprising um, of, of all of them. But you you know equally that sort of interest and, and that. You can see why you know it's an opportunity that he would have wanted to take. Um, I think there's maybe a little bit lighter fullback. Um, I think Fleming definitely helps in terms of that midfield area. Um, and you know, you, you just you just wonder if there's enough goals in in Lyle Foster and Jay Rodriguez. Um, now, company didn't didn't have a twenty goal season striker, but he had someone Nathan Teller who nearly got there and. You're gonna need. It looks like it's barely gonna need that sort of collective goal scoring um, theme like they had under company, um, which you know was proven to work. So that's fine. But I think there are areas where they are still a bit short. But I think when you look when you look at that squad um, against Blackburn, it looks strong. Um, it suddenly looks strong, and okay, you know you never know when when injuries are gonna hit. But I think they've they've built back up that depth and. You know, there's a couple of the longer term injuries. You know, we don't quite know when, you know, when Aaron Ramsey or Nathan Redmond or, uh, you know, a Jordan Bayer may be back. Um, still looks like a while off for, for all three. But if they're able to come back at some point during the season and they're able to contribute, that's going to boost your options even more. You know, you're talking about, you know, Redmond and Ramsey who have, 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 have been able to, to sort of, Certainly, you know, Ramsey in the Championship and a little bit in the Premier League and Redmond especially in the Premier League. You know, they're going to be more important important characters um to, to you know to, to bring back into the fold and buy we all know what he was able to do at championship level um i did say i did want to ask you about mike trezor um what's going on there i, I think i think <laughs> he's one of the players we've spoken about players who have stayed who potentially wanted to leave i think mike trezor's made it obvious he wanted to leave with some of the stuff that he's been doing on instagram and 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 whatnot like what's actually going on with him like has he even returned there was rumors that he hadn't even been back to gorthorpe there's there's little things on the website, like the squad picture is clearly last season's picture, photoshopped onto this season's shirt. He's now putting stories of himself on Instagram in training, but clearly in last season's training gear. Like, what on earth is going on? I presume he wants to leave, and I presume he... Uh, the rumours are he hasn't even come back yet. He may have come back within with, after these rumours came back, I'm not sure. Um, but what's going on with Mike Trezor? Good question. I think that's that's what everyone wants to know, really. Um, I, unfortunately, I, I, I haven't got a sort of, you know a clear answer for you. Um, I think it's obvious that Bernie were interested in in sort of looking to move him on with the you know the interest at the end of the window with you know a couple of, of different deals with discuss with discussed with different clubs. Um, I think Park Parker alluded to it, and it, it was matched up with what I'd heard in terms of he'd, he'd suffered you know he'd had some sort of health problems. Um, which which we was getting treated with, um, 
So it remains to be seen. It's it's going to be interesting to see if he, you know, how and if he's integrated back into the group. It's obviously been a a, a complete nightmare of a move for him. Um, yeah, and and the club because you know the amount of money that they've you know that they paid to to sort of make him a permanent. Um, you know, it's you know it's there's he's not really earned any any of that you know or, or got them any of that back really. Um. He's obviously had different reason. There's different reason for that. Obviously, he didn't you know he arrives late, so he doesn't have that preseason. But then, you know, in the you know in the periods where he did get game time, he didn't really impress. Um, granted, he didn't get much game time or get many mm. consistent opportunities in the team, if you like. Um, and then there was injuries and you know, a couple of different you know problems that the sort of company alluded to. Uh, a little bit cryptically at, at times in press conferences, um, as company always did. <laughs> yeah, so it was. Um, yeah, it's just been a bit of a nightmare for him. So it's it, it'd be interesting to see what happens next because I think if you you know it's, it's clear that this player's got quality. You know, he, he's obviously, and I think Bernie view sort of the the Belgian league is very similar in level to the championship. I think. Um, so if you could get him fifth and you can get him on board, I think. You know, there's a chance that he could be a really, real big asset for Bernie this season. But yeah, his, his Instagram activity and you know that you know the fact that they were looking to move on suggests that you know he, he, that might not be the case. Um, so it'll be an interesting development. I, I I don't quite know if he's back at the training ground yet um, or has been back. Um, presume he must have been. But um, now that the transfer window's short and sort of he's going to be a Bernie player until at least January. Um, then, you know, he, I don't think he's going to go away well until then. Um, so they, uh, you would imagine there's going to be an element of, of integration back in and, and seeing if there's a way of, of working, working everything out. Yeah, well, it will certainly be interesting. And I will, for one, be incredibly surprised if we ever see that man in a Burnley shirt again. Although I'm interested to hear you say that you also heard the health issues because I always do find it um, very convenient when as soon as a player's like want away and starts acting up uh, having worked at a football club before it wasn't Burnley but I, I know that clubs can sometimes just say oh he's injured he's injured at health issues so to say that you've heard that as well um, that sort of like closes it a little bit to be fair it gives me more indication that, that potentially is the case um, moving away from the transfer then to be fair we have we have done about 40 minutes of it so far <laughs> um, I did say this chat would only be a half an hour <laughs> as I always do um your thoughts on Scott Parker so far he's obviously been here now for what a month a month and a half I'm not sure exactly when he was appointed um but you 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 will have met him I remember you've been in the first press conference the unveiling press conference what are your thoughts on on Scott Parker sort of like as a manager and sort of like can he achieve what Burnley want this season which is obviously promotion I think he's been really impressive. I think the way he's dealt with the last few weeks, especially, I think is, is he's you know he's really, I think he's he's really shown you know a, a lot of his character, but also uh, you know a lot of likability that you know he's he's been open and honest about it. He's not tried to hide the fact that you know certain things are going on and certain things are happening, and you know it's. I think I just I kind of described it in the piece, or you know. Sort of the rug's been pulled from under his feet a little bit because mm. when they, when he walked in, this wasn't the plan, and it wasn't the plan for Bernie's board either. But circumstances have led to this situation occurring and, and the way the window went. So, you know, it, it certainly wasn't the, the 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 turnover of players wasn't the expectation. So I think he's he, he's dealt with it relatively well, really well. I think um, just in his, his calmness, really, and 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 being upfront about it and. Not beating around the bush, not ban- trying to be particularly secretive. I think, I think he, he you know, he, he's in a, he's in a good position in the sense that it's this isn't his fault. You know, he's inherited the squad that was, as you know, a number of different you know groups in, if you like, of of players who've been pushing the fringes, players who signed for companies, some players who signed to play in the Premier League, lads who were coming back from loan after being, you know, you know, basically not involved in in companies' plans. So he was trying to mesh all of this together and. And you know, inheriting a, a pretty unhappy dressing room or you know a, a number of unhappy players was wouldn't have been easy for him. And um, so I think I think it's just that you know it's, it, I think he's been really really good. I think the way he's spoken and and I think he, he's he's admitted that it's been tough um, and it's been challenging. And um, 
I think I think what what he's shown and and one of the big re- I mean he's a really impressive person and and Burnley were really impressed by him during the interview process and and in the first few weeks of the season in, in pre-season and just the way he was going about everything and um the work ethic and the amount of time he was putting into things so the dedications there and, and the desire to you know so I think get back on the you know the managerial merry-go-round if you like of of you know building that reputation back up because it took a it took a hit at, especially at Bruges mm-hmm. um you know where he was you know barely there and and there was you know obviously the the cloud that he sort of left under you know Bournemouth under with the you know following the, the heavy defeat to Liverpool um so I think he's he knows that he it's a it's a big you know he's it's just an important job for him that he's got to make a success but I think he knows this league and he knows how to win games in this league and he knows how to get teams promoted from this league. And I think that's also a mass, what was a massive appeal for Burnley. And you can sort of see, I think, the, I mean, the, it's, it's difficult to judge the first four games because they've been so different because yeah, he was effectively working with a different squad for the first two, which was great. Best squad in the league, I think. I think it's fair to say. Um, then the Sunderland game is just this weird anomaly of what on earth's going on. Uh, the walls one, I don't think anyone was particularly bothered. I think so. <laughs> it was all about what was going on off the pitch <laughs> and what was going to happen on Saturday rather than getting through in a cup. Um, but I think you, I think you showed a lot of positive signs against Blackburn and that, you know, he would have only worked with these players, well, a number of the new signings, particularly, you know, for one or two, three days, um, if that. A lot of it would have been game plan and not really doing much session training in terms of tactics and all that type of stuff. So, I think I think he's 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 handled it really really well. Um, so yeah, I think the the Blackburn result was quite big, and I think the performance was even was was more important because for it to come together and and okay yeah the red card changes the game a little bit and and Blackburn whacking a twenty five yard but for that first half well twenty twenty five minutes Benny were really 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 good. Yeah, um, and I think you can see signs of that, and I think the predictability that. You know, sort of set in second half when Blackburn just sat on the edge of the box and and it was you know out to the winger crossing cleared out to the other winger crossing cleared. I think you'll see that develop because all of these uh, a lot of new attacking players in there, a lot of you know patterns that they'll need to learn and and all that type of stuff to 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 sort of pull off the the goals they were scoring against Luton because you know I was told after the Luton game that one of the key things that they were working on was those third man runs and running them behind and. Yeah. And then you see the first two goals are scored in that exact way. So you can see that he can identify weaknesses in opposition and, and coaches players to be able to execute them. So I think that, you know, that stands in good stead. And as I said, as I said earlier, this is a really important couple of weeks for him now to really get into the, you know, obviously some will be away with internationals and stuff, but the majority of that squad will be there. So we'll be able to really get to work with them and, and, and properly, you know, get some get some coaching time and some training pitch time in, in with the players, um, you know, especially the new ones. And and it'll be, you know, you hope that, you know, it's it's not it's a bit of a baptism of fire after the break, isn't it, with Leeds, but um but then you, you hope that they can start building that momentum and and you know, you know, if they get a result uh, you know against Leeds, that would be a perfect way to, to start, you know, what will be a you know a busy few months. Yeah, I agree on the Blackman game. Um, I thought we were brilliant until we got... As Parker alluded to, to, to it himself, and obviously you did there, obviously the sensational goal, which you'll very rarely find me praising them lot, um, from Vyman. Uh, he does that 99 times, and it, and it goes over. High, wide, over, handsome, nowhere near the goal. But obviously that one, unfortunately for us, went in. And we did kind of look a little bit sort of like, like shell-shot by that and never really struggled to get back into the game. Um, obviously, that culminated in them celebrating like they won the World Cup, flares on the pitch and things like that. Um, but I do feel like, obviously, the more that this team plays together, hopefully we will. Because I, I expect a lot of teams will come to Turf Moor and play a lap lap and, and just sit on the edge of the box and say, break us down. We've got to learn to break them types of teams down. We just have to. Because the yeah. smaller teams, that's how they play against us. Um, so it's well, going to be interesting it's, it's, to see. That was the, that was the thing it's company, with company, wasn't it? You yeah, think exactly. that, that first couple of months where every game seemed to be 1-1, and it always yeah. used to be that the opposition would score with the first shot late on. <laughs> yeah. And it was that, how do you get from 1-0 to 2-0? And eventually they learned that, and then it was yeah. fine. So it's, yeah. it is it is just the growing pains of a new manager and, and another new squad coming together. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, th- I think from, from the basis of that, I think they'll be, they, they've, they've 
they've re-established themselves, I think, with the moves that they made in the transfer market as, as still having one of the best squads in the league. And I think that's yeah. you know, that has been good said for, for what's next. And and the, the players who they've brought in all look like they've bought in straight away. And, you know, there's no uncertainty about it all. I wonder why all these these other lads were wanting to leave or have left. And, you know, it looks like they, they've they really sold on on what, what Parker wants to do and what Burnley wants to do this season. So, um, you know, there's a chance for all of them to be Premier League players next year. So, yeah. you know, there's not much more of a carrot that needs dangling than that. Yeah, fingers crossed, as we both alluded to already, um, that we can gel as time goes on. But you did say it is a baptism of fire. Obviously Leeds, but then it's Portsmouth and Oxford. So I I asked a question on Twitter the other day, how many points would you take from the next three? I'd, I'd take six. Seven would be brilliant. Some people saying seven minimum. Like, come on, six minutes. Six has got to be the minimum. If we get anything at Leeds, it's a bonus. Um, but then after that, there's like a run of fixtures where you could look at that and without sounding big headed, you're thinking, well, Burnley could be getting maximum points from these next five, six, seven, eight games here. Um, so we'll have to see um, how we do. And that's that leads on to my next question brilliantly because I do sometimes feel as a fan, I get carried away. I look at them and I think, yeah, we're going up. I look at them and I think, yeah, we can get 50 points from them them games. What Looking at the squad and after watching us um, in the last four games of the season, what are your expectations for Burnley? Because I did say at the start of the season on Sky Sports News that we would win the league. Then everybody <laughs> was sold. <laughs> I couldn't have predicted that. And now obviously I'm taking a little bit of a step back and thinking, Fighting for top two, I think, has got to be the aim. And if we fail, you know, finishing third or fourth and hopefully going up through the playoffs. But what are your expectations for this squad as somebody who isn't a fan? I, th- I think it is. It's, it's that top two spot. I, th- I think, you know, maybe it, you, you don't know how long it's going to take to gel. So you don't quite know what that process is going to take and how long it's going to take for, for Burnley to be fully flying, you know, full of flowing, you know, Scott Parker's team, if you like. Um so I think that 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 creates that element of doubt, and and while we've you know a, a number of the new signings performed well um, in the first game, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're instantly there for a success, and they're going to yeah. play, you know, going to maintain a certain level all the way through. Now, ho- obviously, hopefully they do, and, and Burnley have will have put a lot of time and you know into scouting these players, um, and and will have the data to suggest that you know these players are. You know, because what, what one of the things I was I was sort of told, and you know, sort of right at the end of the window was a feeling that okay, they've lost some of the the magic of of a big and another bear who are you know different level to to most of this league. It is a feeling that they have made upgrades, or you know, at certain positions, um, or you know, have, have been able to to bring players in of a similar ability level of the players that they've let go. Um, so from that point of view, you know, therefore the expectation remains definitely top two but you know I think I think this league's still possible I don't think the championships particularly I don't think it's massively strong I think there's a lot of good teams in there but I don't think there's loads of outstanding teams and I think Burnley can be that outstanding team you know Leeds are obviously going to be a, a massive threat um, and there's a yeah. few in and around it who could be good you know who are going to be good and, and are going to be you know up there I think but I think you know Burnley will look at it and, and feel like they're in a position where they should be you know, top two should definitely top six. I think it would be a disaster if yeah. if this squad was to miss out on the playoffs. I think something would have had to go, you know, pretty wrong for that to happen. Um, not that they should be taking that for granted, but you know, you look at the quality that they've got. You know, they should be fine in in terms of that. They should be at least in the top six. But I think there'd be a disappointment if they're not in the top two. Um, but as I say, that may change if in a couple of months it's still. Find you know still putting the pieces into the jigsaw to find out exactly how it's all going to work and 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 when when he can when they do hit that top form at what point how quickly can they get to that that point? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Leeds are obviously the other team that were in there, even though they lost a lot of players. I thought they recruited quite well as well. Kepo United, I didn't expect to be in the conversation, but again, they've recruited very well. Um, so they're another team that worries me. I think that will be the top three in what order, I'm not sure. I think Sunderland have shown that they are very good, but I do think ultimately they'll fade. Uh, and I can't see Watford maintaining their start, although to be fair, they did lose last time out. Um, last one from me, mate. I did say, and as, as I've already referenced, this will be an half an hour chat. We're nearly doubling it, mate. So this will be the last question from <laughs> me. I do apologise. You have quickly skirted over it recently, uh, the injuries. Obviously, Jordan Bay has got a long-term injury. Nathan Redmond's got a long-term injury. Aaron Ramsey and Del Quar as well. I think I potentially may have missed somebody. Um, as far as I'm aware, 
It's all. It's Bayer is a knee, I think. Redmond's also a knee. Ramsey's a knee, and, and, and I think I think Delqua might be a knee. The knees are very complicated things. I'm not sure. Is is that right? Are they all are they all long term knee injuries? Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure on Bayer. Um, but you might be right. I think Redmond and uh, Ramsey definitely are. Um, so yeah, it's it's. Frustrating in a sense because you know the, these. I mean, Redmond seems to, was it November? Redmond was. You know, I might might have got that completely wrong. Um, you know, it feels like it's a, a been a long time since Nathan Redmond got that injury. But these, especially as you say, the knee can be a complicated thing, and yeah, um, they can take a, a long time to, to come back from. And, and Ramsey's in the same position, but you just hope that that they are able to to sort of get themselves back to full fitness at some point during the season, um, which I you know you'd expect them to. In terms of recovery time, and you know they're able to contribute because, as I said earlier, the, the two really, really good players. And, and by again, is another one. I think he's you know he's had a number of injury problems, and um, you just hope that you know he can sort of just get over that that hit that last hurdle. And there seems to be a lot of hurdles they keep putting being yeah. put in front of him, and because we you know the quality of him, and and um, I wouldn't envy Scott Parker trying to pick a, a back two when by his back and. And fit, and um, you know, with the options he's got in that position. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's it's you know, it's it's frustrating that you've got you know some of some of these players injured, but um, hopefully, as I said, they can they can come back and, and contribute at some point because they'll be they'll be massive assets, especially those three. They'll quite a little bit of a difficult one because you know, he, you know, evidently someone a company new and, and company brought in to sort of be a bit more of a you know, a, a versatile player along the back line to, to enhance those defensive options. So it'd be interesting to see if, if he's part of Parker's plans, you know, a massive part of Parker's plans or not. But I suppose given the not loads of cover at left back, then that might be somewhere there where do you think he could be be effective. But um yeah, especially that those first three are, you know, are, you know, really you know, we know they're really, really good players and and will be a massive benefit and 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 if Del Quark can can enhance the squad and enhance numbers as well, then that that would be helpful too. Yeah, what is the situation on Bayer? Because that we've heard so many times, oh, he's close, he's close, and then we just never seem to see him. The last I saw was it was a bit of a recurring injury that they're not really quite sure on exactly what it is. Is is that the vibe from the club? They're still not hundred percent certain on what um, it is. I think. Well, uh, you, you hope to get into the bottom of it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's been a been while. A while. Yeah. Um I don't I don't I can't say exactly. I think you know the club are you know pretty um protective of injury situations. We saw that yeah, a lot with enough. company and yeah. um you know there's an element of, of of player you know privacy and all that type of stuff which comes into it and <clears throat> I guess with, with especially with long term injuries the, the the idea is you don't want to put a date on it because then there's a unnecessary pressure that are added, is added to players and mm. I think there's there's been some complications with it. Um but you know, hopefully, by the signs of it, they are beginning to get on the right track. Um, without knowing, you know, low, you know, all the details, it looks like they are figuring it out. Um, but the problem is, is that again, you just don't know how long it's going to take to get, you know, all the way back to full fitness. So, um, yeah, it's uh, you know, it, hopefully, um, as I say, they're on the right track, and, and Jordan Bayer will be, you know available for Burnley at some point this season, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah, fingers crossed. He was fantastic in the Championship last season. Um, one more thing as well, Ramsey. I know you've literally just said you don't want to put a date on them or the club don't want to put a date on them. The last I heard with Ramsey, it would be Christmas minimum, potentially towards the end of the season. That would be a massive shame because I do think he would be a brilliant asset in this league as well. Uh, have you heard anything on, on Ramsey in terms of dates or anything like that? Not not on dates, no. Um, but I think was it was it February when he got injured? Um so I think when you think about a, a long term knee injury, you're talking eight, nine, ten months. So I think that yeah. that would probably align, something like that. Um but then the problem is is that there's getting back and then there's getting fit, and then there's the especially yeah, with the knee injuries and, and the longer term injuries, there's then the usually the niggling injuries that then come afterwards that you pick up. As, as a player so you know there's that knock on effect as, as well so it's um yeah I think it, the, the key is to not rush them back and and I think Bernie put themselves in a position now where they don't need to because they've got they've rebuilt that depth as we've spoken about um 
So, yeah, in, in terms of a timeline, given that it was a serious knee injury, February, March, he got injured. So, it, you know, that would sort of suggest that if you do the maths, you're probably, you're probably around that, that period. And then it's the getting fit, getting back up to, to match speed because, you know, you've got to remember he had a number of injuries before that as well. So, you know, it's you it, it might take that little bit extra to get him up to that match fitness and where, where Burnley need him to be and, and, you know, try and get his body in a position where he isn't, you know, he's avoiding these injuries um, rather yeah. than, you know, keep picking them up. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's just about being careful with these types of, because, you know, it's been, he spent a lot of money on him, but he's also very young and he could be a, you know, a, an excellent player in the future. Um, so you don't want to, you don't want to rush him back and do something that is then detrimental for the long term. Um, yeah, I think Conway yeah. spoke, spoke about it um, after the initial injury that it was, you know, it was all about taking the time and, uh, you know, letting him heal and, and making sure it's fully right before you you thrust them back into the action because you're just causing more problems for yourself and the player at that point. Yeah, fair enough. Well, fingers crossed we see him in a Burnley shirt soon. If it is after Christmas, ideally on the 4th of January, please, uh, and then he can stick some in the goals at Ewood Park. But I'm not too worried about that game just yet. Let's... let's, <laughs> let's let... <laughs> Let, let's get us back in, ourselves back in the conversation and obviously get a result at Elland Road as well. But Andy, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. It's always good to have you. We'll, we will wrap it up there. I've literally doubled the time that I said I'd hold you for, so I do apologise. Um, but it also just shows that how easy it is to talk to you and how good of a talker you are, mate. So thank you for coming on. And I'm sure we'll see you on at some point during the season again. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me on.